everyone! Welcome to Photoshop class. I know that you're excited to dive into Photoshop, but before we get into that, we've got to do an introduction to graphics because you've got to understand a little bit about graphics and their formats and their colors and all of that before you really get started editing photos in Photoshop. Now in this class we'll be using Photoshop in the lab and you can also utilize PhotoP, which you can use on any computer, even at home. You don't have to have a license, it's free, and it will work on a Chromebook, although Chromebooks are slow, so it won't be near as fast as using it on a lab computer. So let's get to it. Let's talk about graphics. So when it comes to images, your images are going to be either raster or vector. Raster images are what we call bitmap images. They're, compri they're comprised of pixels. So pixels are teeny tiny dots. So if I take a pencil and I make a dot, that's a pixel. It's a little bitty. And so when we talk about pixels, if you zoom up super, super, super close and something gets pixely, you've probably heard that term, we're talking about a raster image, like the picture that you see here. It's resolution dependent. So if you go, um, like if you have a really big picture, and then you try to take a little bitty picture and put it in with the big picture and then make it bigger, that is gonna be a problem because it's resolution dependent and it's going to, when you pull it up, be a pixely image. It won't be good quality. So that's a big deal because when you're dealing with photos in Photoshop, you need all big pictures so they can all play together nicely. So if you have tiny pictures and you pull them into a big picture, they're gonna be even tinier by comparison. So that's raster images. Now Photoshop images and Photoshop files are raster images. So that's something we have to think about. Now in other classes where you learn illustration, you create vector images and vector images are comprised mathematically. So they're like paths or line art and they're infinitely scalable. So I can make a billboard with something if I wanted to. And they're put together based on some sort of algorithms, not pixels. So if you zoom up and keep going and going and going and going, you can get in 1,200% and it's still not going to get blurry. And in Illustrator, that's what happens. We can zoom up really close in Illustrator. Now fonts, for the most part when they're created, are vectors. You can make a font really, really, really big and it doesn't get pixely because fonts are vectors. But when you put a font on top of something that's pictures and then you save it in a file format, the whole image then becomes a raster image. So aside from the fact that we have to find out, are we creating something with pixels or we're creating something mathematically, and we won't be doing mathematically in Photoshop class, we also have what are called color modes. So for what we're going to do, RGB images, and you could probably guess those have to do with colors, red, green, and blue, and you use those three colors or channels is what we call them in Photoshop, and that creates the color on the screen. In the CMYK mode, and that stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, which you don't have to know for this class, each pixel is assigned a percentage value of ink. So like you get a certain percentage of blue, and a certain percentage of yellow, and that gives us green, right? So they're based on percentages. Um, if you have an RGB, you can convert it into a CMYK when you're done and separate those colors. So in a desktop publishing class, or a class where you're going to be separating colors, or printing um, like with a Cricut or a Silhouette or something like that, you might need to have CMYK color separation. Although you can technically color separate with RGB. And then this is a problem format, <laughs> indexed color. So GIF format images, which we'll talk about in a little bit, have what are um, index color modes. And unlike those other color modes, index color modes don't have as many colors to them. So what they have to do is, if you try to mix an index color with a different color, it has to like guess and pick a color out of the 16 million colors that you have that's closest to one of those 256 colors. Index color is a problem in Photoshop because your images need to be in the same color mode to play nice. And almost all images are RGB images. If you download them off the internet or you take a picture on your phone. So if you go find a picture online, say it was an animation, and you pull it in, the animation will be an index color. So you won't be able to pull it into the Photoshop file without changing the color mode to RGB. So understand that that's a kind of a big Photoshop problem, but the color modes have to be the same to play nicely. So here's just a little more detail from the University of Michigan's library uh, about color modes. 
And again, I don't expect you to know all the details on color modes. Just understand that what we're working with in this class, for the most part, will be RGB color mode. In Photoshop, you can change the color modes by going to the Image menu and going to Mode. And then you choose which color mode that you want. So if it's in Index, you can choose to put it in RGB, for example. So now let's talk file formats. There's lots of file formats out there, a ton of them. As you download files from the internet to use, they're going to be in different formats. So most commonly, pictures are going to be JPEG format, JPG. These are the extension that's at the end of the file. It's like dot and then these letters. Um, TIFF is also one that you probably won't run into much. Um, GIF, which your animated images are. PNG, which is a pretty popular web format. And then I put these yellow ones because these yellow colored ones are what we call native formats. They're formats for a certain program. So in Photoshop, our native file format is going to be PSD. So Photoshop files are going to be PSD. All right, and then in those vectors that I talked about before, EPS, SVG, and Adobe Illustrator files are going to be, which are AI files, are going to be vector. And so... SVG files are what you use with those Cricut or Silhouette machines to, um, you know, like maybe print onto a t-shirt or make a bumper sticker or whatever. And um, you need that format because you want it to be as clear as possible. You don't want to have to deal with blurry edges. Okay, so let's look at the file formats compared. Again, native file format we need to be aware of for Photoshop is PSD. And Photo P, which we'll be playing with, can also save and open PSD files, which is why I like it whenever we can't be in class. So PSD is Photoshop's native format. Now, you always want to keep a copy when you're working of your file in its native format. So if I have like five JPG images, like five photos off the Internet, and I put them all together into one, I want to save that as a PSD file. Even though whatever one I started with is my background and I drug all the rest of them in, even though those are all JPEGs, if I save that as a JPEG, they're all going to get glued together. So a PSD keeps it in Photoshop format, which keeps them all separated. So I can pick them up and still scoot them around, like you could on a slideshow or something in a, in a Google slideshow. You know, we put stuff on a slide, we can scoot them around. We put stuff on a PowerPoint slide, we can scoot them around. But if we were to save a PowerPoint slide as a JPEG, which, by the way, you can do, it glues it all together, and then you can't scoot anything around. So when we're dealing with Photoshop, we always want to save a copy in PSD format. And some people will even save one every day, especially if you're working on a Chromebook in PhotoP, because you're going to have to load it and then use it, and you're going to have to download it. So, like, you may have a day one of this project Photoshop file and then a day two of this project, just in case, just to have a backup copy. That's not a bad plan. So some other file formats, let me get my head out of the way so you can see the corner here. Um, some other file formats, again, that I mentioned are over there, but let's talk about the ones I want you to at least be aware of because these are ones that you're gonna run into when you're saving files. Okay, so PNG stands for Portable Network Graphics. I'm not worried that you know that. Um, but PNG is what we use for, a lot of times for like web banners. That's sort of something you put at the heading of a web page that might have some photos on it, but also text. Um, these do not lose quality as you save them. So if I work on a PNG file and I save it as a PNG file and keep working on it, it stays good quality. Um, so it's what we call lossless compression. It doesn't lose quality as we save it, but it does compress the file. Um, PNG files can have transparency, which is why they're good to use on websites, because you can have transparent clear parts so your background can show through. Like this picture of this business cards that's on this uh, slide, it it's not on a white background, right? So it looks way better on the slide. So when I'm making things and I want to put them on slides, I always export them out as PNG files because then I, they get rid of that ugly white background. I don't want to have those because that doesn't look cool. Um, PNG can have 16 million colors, and that's a big deal because there's another file format that can have transparency, but unfortunately it can't have all those colors. So that's not as good. All right, so GIF file format. You guys are all familiar with GIFs, because everybody likes to send people GIFs, right, to comment or respond or whatever when you're texting your friends. Notice how on this GIF image, though, the white edges around it, they're kind of blurry looking. Do you see that as it gets bigger and goes from the, like, map to the globe? 
So GIFs are also lossless compression. They don't lose quality and they can be transparent and they can be animated. They have like all kinds of things going for them, except the last thing, 256 colors. So a minute ago I said 16 million colors, right? Yeah, not GIFs, 256 colors max. So this is where it has to guess. GIFs use that index color mode I just mentioned earlier. So if we had a picture of a globe like this and we brought it into Photoshop and we turned it into a GIF image, because you can make animations, but we turned it into a GIF image, it's going to not be able to get all the colors. And so it's going to guess. It's going to pick like the closest color out of the 16 million colors it has to choose from. It's only got 256. So we lose a lot of quality. That's why when you see those little GIFs, like a lot of times if it's a picture, it's like a person and they're like, ha, ah, ah, ha, or whatever. You like that example? Um, the quality isn't good like a regular photo would be. And that's because GIFs, though they can have transparency and they can be animated, they're good for web pages in that way, they can only have 256 colors. So when do I ever use a GIF? Well, when I'm teaching web design and I need an animation on a page. That's it. That's the only time. Because otherwise they're just not the best quality. Okay, what you're going to use most of the time is going to be this one, JPEG. JPEG is the uh, probably the most common file format that's out there. It's the one we use for photos. Um, most of your phones, if you have a webcam or like your Chromebook or whatever, it's going to take pictures and J they're going to be JPEG. Um, they do have lossy compression. So something about a JPEG that you need to know is if you open it and do something to it and save it as a JPEG again and then open it the next day, do something to it and save it to it again, each time you save, it's going to recompress the file and the quality is going to degrade just a little bitty bit each time. So that's one of the disadvantages of a JPEG. JPEGs cannot support transparency and they cannot be animated, but they have that 16 million colors. So they're common on the web for images, so actual photos or just regular printing. If you're going to upload a picture to Walmart or Walgreens and have it printed, you're probably using the JPEG. Um, they're perfect for email, any school projects. That's what JPEGs are ideal for. Unless we need transparency. And then which format is Miss Skinner going to use? PNG format, because it still has 16 million colors, right? 16 million colors. That's what I want if I want to have that transparent background but still have high quality, right? Okay, so that's that one. Now, uh, iPhone people. If you have an iPhone or an iPad, the iOS, a couple versions ago, decided to use their own file format. They have their own proprietary file format called HEIC format, and it cannot be opened in a lot of programs. Um, now, over time, things will update, more things will be able to open it, but like right now, that's kind of a problem format. So sometimes people are doing a slideshow, and they're like sending people pictures, and they send them iPhone pictures, and then the person can't use the pictures. <laughs> So there's online converters, like you can convert it. If you have an iPhone, it's sometimes handy to go in, and there's a link on the bottom of this slide, so you can pull up the slideshow yourself and go there if you needed to, but you can go in and make it so that under formats of your camera, it uses the more compatible format, which is JPEG, instead of the high efficiency. So that HE in the HEIC stands for high efficiency, because you can save more pictures. So it's like a compressed format, that lets you save more pictures on your phone, which is why iPhone does it. And then RAW. RAW is a format that people use if they're professional photographers. A good professional photographer shoots in RAW format. We're not going to spend a lot of time messing with RAW in here except when we do a little bit of, of our photography unit, but just understand that we have rebels in the classroom that you guys are allowed to use, and they're going to shoot in RAW format. Now, the extension that they are is not like .raw. It's .cr2 on these cameras. Um, but you can set your camera. You can see, like, if you set your camera to high quality, it's going to be a JPEG, like you see. But I can set my camera to RAW, and that's, like, super high quality. Now, notice these are humongous. When you look down here on this chart to RAW, they're huge images. So they're really big images, Okay. Um, you can also, on most cameras, set it to shoot in RAW and JPEG at the same time. That's what that RAW plus um, L for the high-quality large image. So you can do both. It takes a little longer to save, but you can set it to do both. So basically, um, RAW is kind of like a digital ne negative. So you have to process it to be able to use it, which means in Photoshop, when you open a RAW image, it actually opens in kind of a pre-opening screen where you can do some things to it before you even open it. And then it converts it to a JPEG in Photoshop for you to edit.
RAWs are huge files because they are not compressed. Um, and yeah, like I said, professional photographers are going to shoot in RAW. So lastly, the last slide is a link to this 99designs website. So if there's anything that you weren't able to complete your note sheet about, um, you can get, go to that website, and I'm going to take you there for just a minute just so you can see. Um, this will take it down to a chart for you so you can see the difference between raster and vector images, and then what kind of would be for what, and the difference between that CMYK and the RGB and what they stand for is on here. And then there's kind of the list of formats. And then as you go down here, it will explain to you examples of the two different in, in the things that contrast like that, like R and RGB and CMYK, and why would you use one or the other, and lossy versus lossless. And then your JPEG image talking about compression. When you save something as a JPEG, it compresses it. So like you can set it to not compress it if you tell it to, um, but you could also set it to compress it a lot. And so the difference here, see this one's not compressed, this one's on high compression, and the picture's blurry. So you have to be very, very careful. Sometimes when you upload a picture to like websites and stuff, it'll automatically compress it when you upload it. And then you end up with a picture that's not as good a quality. And then I love this website here because it says like you should use a JPEG when you're dealing with online photos or artwork. Or you want to print photos or you want to send a quick preview to a client or something. And then don't use it if it's going to be transparent or you need a layered file or whatever. So this breaks down all of these for you. You can go back in if there's anything that you missed from the lecture and just kind of take a peek at this website. It's a really nice website um, that kind of goes back through all those file formats. So hopefully you have a better understanding of file formats for images because this is something that you really need to nail down in this class because as we save pictures, you need to kind of have an idea of what those file formats mean. All right, good luck to you.